Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is the next in the series looking at the financial implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the global economy. And in today's video, I want to talk about the housing market. Now, you might not think that there's a direct link between what's happening in Ukraine right now and the prices of houses on your road, but everything today in the global economy is interrelated. So I want to go through what the key issues are for housing, what's been going on in housing, where we are right now, and then what's likely to happen over the next three to six months and the influence of the Russian invasion on all of those factors. So in today's video, we'll look at demand for housing, we'll look at the supply of housing, we'll look at what's likely to happen with interest rates and the supply of money, and then finally, I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think is likely to happen in the housing market through the course of 2022 and as we go into 2023. So before we get into all of that, if I could ask you to give me a thumbs up at some point during this video if you're enjoying the content and also to subscribe if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I always include chapters in my videos. So if there's a section you're not particularly interested in, it's really easy to skip over it and move on to the next. So why do people want to buy houses? Well, there's a number of different factors that drive individuals to want to make a purchase. One of the main drivers in society is the aspirational concept of owning your own property. It's seen as a status symbol and it's seen as a degree of success in a lot of people's lives. If you can get to the point where you own your own property, then you've got an element of having made it. Now, in addition to the aspirational side of things, you've also got the financial elements. So renting is seen to be a waste of money in a lot of countries around the world. People hate renting because it's expensive and you don't get anything out of it. You get somewhere to live for a period of time, whether it be a week or a month or a year. And at the end of that period, you've got nothing to show for it. You don't own anything and all you've done is been paying somebody else's mortgage and helping them to pay off their debts. So it's seen in a lot of societies as something that's not desirable to rent and everybody would prefer to buy. Buying property is also seen as a good long-term investment. If you look at what's happened to property prices over the last 5, 10, 20 years, you will have seen a steady increase in prices. So if you'd have bought something 20 years ago, you would definitely be in profit right now. So it's seen to be a good investment for capital. You will generally make a return on property. And a final factor over recent years is that it's actually been cheaper to buy somewhere than it is to rent because mortgage rates have become so cheap and easily available. From a monthly budgeting perspective, it actually made financial sense to buy because it will cost you less per month than it would to pay a landlord for your rent in a lot of countries. In most countries around the world, demand for housing is currently at the highest level it has ever been. One of the outcomes of the pandemic globally is that there was a huge drive for people who wanted to buy their own property. Everybody was spending more time at home and working from home became more of an accepted practice. And a lot of people suddenly wanted to have their own space and they wanted bigger properties that had a home office within them and some more space and some garden and all of those factors. And the other thing about working from home is that it unlocked areas that people would never previously have considered moving to. So in the old days when you had to travel to work five days a week, generally most people did not want to travel for more than an hour. So you had a very defined zone of where commuters would live around every city in the world. But working from home has really changed all of that. You can now go into the office less frequently. You may not even have to go into the office at all in some jobs. And what that did is it opened up the whole world of opportunities in terms of buying a property. So you could now look at somewhere that was much more remote, much further out, somewhere maybe that was two or three hours away from where your place of work is. Because if you can connect remotely, then you don't need to make that journey on a daily basis. So that whole new world of opportunity really fueled demand across the board. We saw increases in demand in places that hadn't really seen any uplift for a long period of time because people could move from more expensive inner city areas to the countryside, to the coast, 
to near to rivers and mountains. And the property generally was much cheaper in those areas. And so it was more affordable. So people who previously couldn't afford to buy in the city suddenly realized that they could afford to buy somewhere that was two hours away from where their work was. And that brought lots of new buyers into the market and fueled the increase in demand. The other main driver for the increase in demand was what's been referred to as the race for space. So a lot of people wanted more space at home because they were spending more time there. They wanted a home office or maybe two home offices if both parents were working from home. They wanted a home gym. They wanted a bigger garden. People were getting dogs through the pandemic, so they needed more space for the dog. They're having more children. So there was a lot of reasons why people wanted bigger properties. And because they had more flexibility on the location of those properties, the demand suddenly started to explode. And in terms of affordability, because interest rates came down so low, it meant that people could borrow more and it was still affordable. So that enabled them to stretch their budgets. So when you combine the desire for more space, the opportunity to move further away and a larger budget, it opens up so many options in terms of your choice of property. And therefore, there was a massive increase in demand and it hasn't yet been satisfied. So we've still got a huge amount of people who are desperate to buy property right now. Supply is an entirely different story. There are two elements to the supply of housing. First is the new build and second is the second hand market. And what happened with regards to new build during the pandemic was a lot of construction sites were either stopped or slowed down significantly. So everybody wasn't sure what was happening. A lot of workers were sent home. And within the industry, a lot of the supply chain was also stopped. So we saw the production of timber stopping, steel, bricks, cement, all of the factories around the world shut their doors and were not producing any of the required materials. As the lockdown started to be lifted, it has taken quite a long period of time for construction companies to get back towards anywhere near full capacity. A lot of the employees had disappeared, so they had to rehire people. And then they found there were problems with the global supply chain. So we've seen problems with the supply of timber and insulation and roofing materials and bricks. So there's been a shortage. There's also been price increases and there's also been bottlenecks. So that has all led to a major slowdown in the production of new housing. We also saw a reduction in the availability of existing properties for sale. When the pandemic struck, the whole of the world was told not to have any social contact with anybody outside of your immediate family. So that meant that inviting people into your home to have a look to buy it was an absolute non-starter. So none of that was happening. And then even when we started coming out of lockdown, there was a huge fear factor all across the world. Everybody was very nervous about coming into contact with other individuals. We all wore masks and it's still having an impact today. There are still a lot of people who are nervous about mixing in groups and inviting strangers into their homes. So we've got a real hangover here with regards to the housing market because a key element of selling your house is being able to let people come and have a look around it. So if you're nervous about opening your door and letting strangers in, then you're not going to do that. So we've still got a restriction on supply, but we've also got a factor that is linked to house prices. So house prices have been going up dramatically over the last 18 months, and that's put a lot of people off selling their houses. Because if you think that prices are going to go up further, you may decide to hold on and wait for a higher price, but also the majority of people who sell their property are looking to move to another property. And generally you'll look to move to a bigger property that's more expensive. So in a rising market, some people are put off from doing that because they know they'll have to put even more capital into the new purchase. So a rising market can restrict the supply of existing stock because people just decide that they'll sit tight or that they'll just add an extension, add more space to their existing property. So on the supply side of things, we've seen a double whammy. We've seen a reduction in the new stock and we've seen a restriction in the amount of existing stock coming to the market. The result of the massive increase in demand and the limitations on supply has meant that demand has significantly outstripped supply 
And simple economics tells you when you get a situation like that in any market, it always leads to an increase in prices. And we have seen prices rise dramatically over the last 18 months. And we've heard of lots of situations where there have been people paying above the asking price. That's been relatively common over the last 12 months that people have paid more than the initial price that the house was advertised for. We've heard about people buying property without even visiting it. They're just looking on the internet and making a purchase. And we've also seen a lot of corporates coming into the market who are buying property en masse. They're buying large blocks of property for future rental purposes. And the low cost and easy availability of mortgage has fueled the market even more. So prices are now at an all time high in a lot of markets around the world. And in the past, house prices were generally linked to the level of salary that was being paid in the market. So you could usually borrow two or three or four times your annual salary from the bank. And that would then give you a pool of capital to go and buy a property. But now there's been a dislocation between the price of property and the average salary. So we're now seeing house prices of six, seven, eight, ten times the average salary. So it's becoming less and less affordable for the average person in the street to be able to buy these properties. People need large deposits or they're borrowing money from their mum and dad or from family. And the only reason that a lot of people have been able to afford these prices is because the cost of borrowing is so low. So if interest rates on average are normally 5%, but you can borrow at 2.5%, that technically means that you can borrow double the amount of cash and it would still cost the same per month. And that's the logic that people have been applying. They've been looking at the affordability of the mortgage and borrowing the absolute maximum that they can get their hands on. And the problem that you have with that setup is that it's leverage. And once people have a lot of debt, if there's a movement in interest rates, that causes them a big problem. When the pandemic struck, interest rates were dropped to extremely low levels all around the world. We saw rates of 0.1% in many countries. And the benefit of that for home buyers is that it brought the cost of mortgages down because banks could source capital from their central bank at 0.1% interest. It meant that they could lend to consumers for half a percent or 1% or 1.5% and still make a healthy profit. So people who wanted to buy houses could get very, very low cost mortgages. And some of these mortgage deals were available for 5, 10, 15, 20 year periods. So it was a really great deal. It's a fantastic opportunity for house buyers. So the combination of very low interest rates and all of the demand characteristics that I talked about earlier in this video meant that we had an explosion in terms of mortgage applications and people wanting to buy property. They saw this as a once in a lifetime opportunity to buy property for a very low cost in terms of the average monthly payback. The other main driver for demand was the availability of mortgages. So when the pandemic struck, a lot of central banks around the world embarked on what's known as quantitative easing programs. So they were buying back government bonds in the market from corporates in order to fuel the supply of money in the economy. And by doing that, what it did is it gave cash to the financial institutions and they then wanted to pass that on in the form of loans. So mortgages are seen as one of the most attractive loan products because you have security over the property and people generally pay their mortgage. It's one of the last things that you fail to pay if you're running out of money because you don't want to lose your home. So the quantitative easing programs led to a huge increase in the supply of money. All the financial institutions wanted to make loans as quickly as possible and they could offer very low interest rates on those mortgages. So this led to an explosion in the number of mortgages and it became a feeding frenzy in the housing market. And that's the situation that we've had over the last 18 months or so. And that's one of the reasons why we've seen prices rise consistently and dramatically over the period since we came through the pandemic. So what's the outlook for the housing market now? Well, the housing market is directly linked to interest rates and the supply of mortgages. So demand is high right now for a few reasons, but the easy availability of cheap finance is one of the key factors. 
Now, we've got a situation globally right now where inflation is at all time highs in a lot of countries. And the central banks are now focusing in on inflation as something that they need to bring back down. And the main way they're going to do that is by increasing interest rates. So we've already seen interest rate increases in the USA, the UK, Canada, New Zealand, a number of other countries. And that is going to be a continuing trend through the whole of 2022 and probably into 2023 as well. And we're seeing large percentage increases right now. So we're coming from a very low base. So in a lot of countries, it's at 0.1 or 0.25. And we're seeing movements to 0.5 or 0.75 or 1%. So they're still low rates, but percentage wise, we're seeing a doubling of the base rate of interest. And that is going to hurt people who have large mortgages. So the people I talked about earlier who've maximized the amount that they could borrow, they've actually stretched themselves to the limit. If they don't have a fixed rate for the whole rest of that mortgage term, at some point, the interest rate will be increased in line with the increase in the base rates. And that's going to cause major problems. And that is going to be a big problem for the housing market. The other issue is the supply of money. So the quantitative easing programs have now been stopped in most countries around the world. So that free flow of liquidity and cash is no longer available to the financial institutions. So they're now going to have to stop making all of these new loans and it's going to be more difficult to find the mortgages. So the combination of an increase in the price of new mortgages, the reduction in the supply of new mortgages and also the increase in the supply of existing mortgages is really going to hit the housing market hard. So as we go through the rest of this year, we will see a slowdown in the increase in prices. And at some point, if interest rates are hiked, really aggressively, which could easily happen because inflation is at such high levels, then that could really cause a turning point in the market. And we could see prices starting to fall during 2022 or certainly into 2023. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because I'm trying to show everybody what the link in the global economy is between what's happening in Ukraine right now and what's happening on your road. So housing and house prices is something that affects everybody around the world. And interest rates are a critical part of the housing market, as well as the supply of money. And the main problem we've got at the moment globally is inflation. And inflation has occurred from a variety of factors, but the main driver today is commodity prices. The price of oil, the price of natural gas, the price of food substances, iron ore and other materials. And those prices have been driven up dramatically since Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia is a big supplier of a lot of raw materials. It's a major supplier of oil and natural gas, but it also has a wealth of other natural resources. And as the rest of the world is now deciding not to deal with Russia, they're having to look elsewhere. And that means that prices have gone up significantly. And the sanctions that are in place are likely to stay around for a long period of time. So this is going to have a long term impact and we're going to see inflation staying at high levels. So the only way to counter that is to hike interest rates and hiking interest rates is the worst thing possible for the housing market because it will hurt all the existing borrowers and it will stop new entrants coming into the market. So if interest rates are hiked significantly, we could very easily see the market going from record highs to massive falls in terms of the price. Now, there's a fine line balancing act somewhere in the middle. As long as rates don't get pushed up too quickly and too aggressively, then the housing market may cope but we just don't know what's going to happen. If this conflict carries on much longer, if people decide they no longer want to do any business with Russia, if the natural gas got switched off, if the, all of the oil exports got returned, then we would see commodity prices going even higher. We'd see inflation being pushed up further, and that could lead to really sharp increases in interest rates. It's extremely likely that the growth in house prices will slow down. There is a possibility that we could see everything level off and we have a flat market. And there's also a high possibility if interest rates get moved up dramatically, that we could see a crash in the housing market at some point over the next 12 months or so. So we need to keep a sharp eye on what's going on. Have a look at those interest rates and have a look what's happening in the housing markets around the world. 
So hopefully you found this useful and informative today. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. And for any of my regular viewers who are still watching, I wanted to ask you another question. I recently opened the Patreon account, which is a way of viewers supporting the channel. And I wanted to ask what people think of Patreon, whether or not they think it's a good idea. And I wanted to ask what sort of entry level people think is appropriate for Patreon. So thanks again for watching and I'll see you again soon.